Hello everyone, I am Dr. Anupama Chaudhary Devgan, your Physiology Faculty. This is my daily quiz series for NEET PG 2025. The quiz is available on my Telegram channel and the video explanations on my YouTube channel. We are already into our week three. We have covered CNS, nerve physiology, CVS and respiratory systems. This week we start with general physiology and muscle physiology. Let's have a look at the first question. Now this says, which of the following fluids has a sodium of 10 milliequivalents per liter and potassium of 140 milliequivalents per liter? In other words, the question is asking you, which is a sodium poor potassium rich fluid? Now, uh, when you look at the ECF and the ICF, ECF is sodium rich potassium poor and ICF is potassium rich sodium poor. So the answer to this question becomes the ICF. When you look at the distribution of total body water, the total body water, two thirds of the total body water is in the intracellular compartment and one third is in the ECF and ECF consists of interstitial fluid and plasma. In terms of percentages of body weight, total body water is 60% of body weight, ICF is 40%, ECF is 20%, interstitial fluid is 15% of the body weight and plasma is 5% of the body weight. In other words, three-fourths of the ECF or 75% of the ECF is in the interstitial compartment. Now, the composition of the ECF, interstitial fluid and plasma is nearly the same. The major difference between the interstitial fluid and plasma is uh, the osmolality is absolutely the same, chemical composition is the same, except that plasma has got proteins. Interstitial fluid lacks proteins. Let's have a look at this very, very important table. What is the difference between ECF and ICF? Questions have come from here, so let's have a look. Osmolality of both ECF and ICF is the same, but the most osmotically active particle in the ECF is sodium, in the ICF is potassium. The major cation in the ECF sodium, in the ICF potassium, major anion in the ECF is chloride and bicarbonate, whereas in the case of ICF, it is miscellaneous phosphates and proteins. A difference between the ECF and the ICF is in the pH, a higher pH in the ECF 7.4 and 7.1 in the ICF. Let's have a look at the next question. It says, 40-year-old patient presents with ptosis and fatigue, which worsens towards the end of the day. So this is a very big hint. It, it is worsening towards the end of the day. And it improves after a period of rest. He's likely to have which of the following? Is it going to be myasthenia gravis or is it going to be Lambert-Eaton syndrome? These are two uh, clinical conditions which present with muscle weakness, but there is a very characteristic history. In the case of Lambert-Eaton syndrome, the patient has maximum weakness in the early morning. His weakness worsens as, uh, uh, his weakness in fact improves as the day progresses. But in my senior gravis, the maximum weakness will be in the late evenings, less in the morning, more in the late evenings. And why this difference? This is because Lambert-Eaton syndrome is a disease of the presynaptic membrane, where antibodies are against the voltage-gated calcium channels on the nerve terminal. Myasthenia gravi gravis is a disease of the postsynaptic membrane where the antibodies are against the acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. In case of Lambert-Eaton syndrome, maximum weakness in the morning, early mornings when he gets up, he feels the maximum weakness, but as the day progresses, his weakness improves. This is because repeated stimulation causes an accumulation of calcium and increases the release of acetylcholine. Whereas in the case of myasthenia gravis, 
When he gets up in the morning, he feels okay. But as the day progresses, his weakness worsens. This is because repeated stimulation causes release of acetylcholine and causing therefore a depletion of acetylcholine towards the end of the day. What can cause an improvement in his symptoms? Rest or by using drugs such as uh, anticholine esterase. Choline esterase is an enzyme which degrades acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. So if I use a drug which blocks this enzyme, it will cause a local increase in acetylcholine, improving the symptoms. So going back to my question, worsens towards the end of the day, improves our after a period of rest is myasthenia gravis. What happens in malignant hyperthermia? Malignant hyperthermia, uh, there is a mutation of the ryanodine receptors which are present on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When this patient is exposed to inhalational anesthetics or to succinylcholine, there is an uncontrolled release of calcium, there is muscle contraction and his temperature shoots up. This patient usually presents as an anesthetic emergency. In tibialis muscular dystrophy, there is a mutation of the contractile protein, titin. Let's have a look at the next question. Which of the following conditions can precipitate tetany? So what is tetany? Tetany, there is an increase in the neuronal and muscle excitability. And what can cause tetany is a hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia will increase the neuronal and muscle excitability and that is why carpopedal spasm, Schwastek sign positive, that is seen in hypocalcemic tetany. Now the question says which of the following can precipitate tetany, especially in a patient of borderline hypocalcemia. Hyperoxemia, hypercarbia do not affect the calcium levels. But what happens in respiratory alkalosis? Let us try and see that. How can there be respiratory alkalosis, especially when a patient hyperventilates? Yes, this happens whenever a patient is anxious. Anxiety causes a hyperventilation. When a patient hyperventilates, there is a CO2 washout. And CO2 washout will cause a respiratory alkalosis. Now, remember when you look at the total plasma calcium, the total calcium in the plasma exists in two forms. Half of this total calcium is bound. It is bound to proteins, to phytates, to oxalates and 50% is free or ionic calcium. Now in a respiratory alkalosis, when I look at the plasma proteins, remember the plasma proteins are extremely important buffers. They are one of the chemical buffers which are present in the plasma. The other important one being bicarbonate. So these proteins tend to bind H+, right? They tend to bind the H+. In an alkalosis, the number of H+, ions will reduce. So what happens is, these sites on the proteins now start binding another cation, which is calcium. So what will happen is the free or the ionic calcium will reduce because some of this free calcium gets bound. So what has happened? There is a decrease in the free or the ionic calcium. There is an increase in the bound calcium. But the total calcium is unchanged. So what is going to happen when there is a decrease in the free calcium? It now causes tetany. So the patient starts having spasms. So respiratory alkalosis is a condition which can cause tetany. Even though the total calcium is not reduced, 
it there is a decrease in the free calcium because more of the free calcium has now been bound to the plasma proteins. Let's look at the next question. Identify the type of transport across the cell membrane in the given image. Now, whenever you have a question like this, the first thing that I'm going to see is that there is a protein which is involved. So that means it is a carrier mediated transport. Now, that means it cannot be simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is not carrier mediated. The other three, facilitated diffusion, primary active transport, secondary active transport are carrier mediated. Now, the second thing which you're going to see when you get an image like this is the movement of the substance from higher to lower concentration or lower to higher concentration. As you can see in this diagram, it is from higher to lower concentration. And if it is from higher to lower concentration, that means it does not need energy. That means it is a passive transport. And which is a passive transport? Facilitated diffusion. So the answer to this question becomes facilitated diffusion. Primary active transport, secondary active co and counter transports are carrier mediated, but the movement of the substance is against a concentration gradient from lower to higher concentration, and that requires energy. So the answer to this question is facilitated diffusion. Now this is what causes detachment of myosin head from the active site or actin during a muscle contraction. Now, uh, let us look at the actin myosin cross bridge cyclic. Now, when a muscle is at rest, the myosin head, this is in a high energy, high affinity state. What does that mean? That means it is ready to bind with actin, but it cannot do so because the active sites on actin are being covered by tropomyosin. Now, as soon as calcium becomes available, it will bind with troponin C. There is a conformational change in troponin and that causes the tropomyosin to slide. And what gets exposed is this active site on actin. The moment the active site on actin is exposed, the myosin head, which is already in a high affinity state, goes and binds with this active site on actin. This is by reversible bonds. Now it will use that energy and now it will execute what is known as a power stroke. The head will move on the neck towards the tail like that and it pulls the actin along with it. Now ATP attaches to the myosin head and when ATP attaches to the myosin head, this now causes the head to detach. There is a detachment of head. And once the head detaches, now remember the head has got the ATPase enzyme. Now the next step is a hydrolysis of ATP by the enzyme ATPase to form ATP plus inorganic phosphorus plus energy. And the head goes back into that high energy, high affinity state. So the question which I've asked you is, how does the head get detached. Head is detached once the ATP attaches to the myosin head. Please remember this actin myosin cross bridge cycling will continue till calcium is available. Once calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the cycle stops at this point. So go back to, my, to this question, what is causing a detachment of head? This is binding of ATP to the myosin head.